Uh, aloha, good morning everyone from Hawaii. Um, thank you for having me today. Uh, I am going to present a research project that I did in 2019, which focuses on the multi-generational photo voices of changing traditional farming system in Bali, also known as the Subak system, perspective from the UNESCO cultural landscape. I have to say that this initiative was based on my involvement with the nomination and management efforts of the cultural landscape, uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site in Bali. So I wanna thank uh, Photo Voice International, which was funded through a grant uh, by the Ford Foundation to conduct a series of Photo Voice initiative across Indonesia. So this is how I will outline my presentation today. Uh, I will begin by briefly introducing what SUBAK is, how it was inscribed as UNESCO World Heritage Site and its management efforts after inscription. Uh, and then I will describe the Photo Voices initiative that we had in one of the site within the cultural landscape, followed by key themes that emerge from the participant. I will conclude with Photo Voices as a metho uh, methodology and engaging perspective from below. So this is, a, uh, this is a photo of the Subak landscape of Jatilui or Subak Jatilui, where my research took place. Uh, you can easily recognize it through the layers of rice terraces. Um, Subak is an institution of farmers that manage irrigation water. It has existed for a thousand year and represent the Trihitakarana uh, philosophy, a local belief uh, on the three causes of happiness and prosperity and this includes a harmonious relationship between the people and the spiritual realm, between people and people, and between people and the environment. So this is how Subak represent the Trihitakarana philosophy. Um, it maintained a good relationship with the environment, mountain and forest here as water catchment areas and water reservoir. Uh, you can see on, top, uh, on the top corner of your screen how the Subak divide water that goes into each irrigation channels. Um, and then farmers build a dam to collect water from its sources, like from rivers, or they collect water from natural dams, like lakes up here, uh, as you can see there. And it runs through the complex irrigation networks of um, irrigation channels going straight into the rice terraces right here. Uh, those farmers collecting water from the same water source are called one subak. Subak has one inlet and one outlet system that guarantees uh, the water runs through every rice field before they go back, before the water goes back to the river. And in each water division, as you can see in the pictures, uh, a shrine would be placed to honor the goddess of the lake or Dewi Danu. And, and every 10 full moon, which usually falls between March or April, uh, the farmers would gather in the temple to thank you, uh, to thank Dewi Danu by presenting some of their harvests. So uh, here in this photo, it shows the relationship between people and people. So farmers regularly meeting in Subak meeting to decide planting, harvesting, and all kinds of rituals and ceremonies that they need to perform in every cycles of the season. There are various challenges threatening the existence of the Subak system in Bali. First, uh, land use change. The boom of tourism industry in Bali slowly converted productive rice field into tourism infrastructure. Uh, land use change in the island has resulted in the loss of rice field of about 700 up to 1,000 hectares per year. Um, Bali receive uh, like 8 million domestic visitors and around 4 million visitors every year before the pandemic. And you can see in the photos how like it's so easy to find uh, villa for rent or villa for sale and they're being built right next to a rice terraces like this in Bali. Um, the next threat is reallocation of water rights. Land use change, uh, deforestation, as well as climate change has resulted in a decreased amount of water supply to the Subak. You can see that the rice field needed more water here. Uh, the water in the dam is diminishing. Uh, and then there's also an increased use of groundwater well, which gives pressure to the aquifer and creating another problem to the island. I'm also doing research uh, on a Bali water crisis since 2010, and there's predictions that Bali might not have access uh, to clean water in the next like 10 years. 
Third is land taxation. In Bali, land tax is based on the value of the land. So if there was a building, say a restaurant or a villa built next to a rice field, the land tax for the rice field increases up to a thousand percent. So land tax is not based on the productivity of the land. And I took this from the internet and this, this is a good photos that uh, shows the pressure the farmers have that they often have to sell their rice field because not only they have to pay a lot more taxes, um, they also lose uh, the irrigation channels and access to sunlight with buildings surrounding their rice fields. Uh, last but not least is the aging farmers. This is a photo of the head of the Subak. Uh, they're called Pakase. The younger farmers are already in their late 40s or early 50s. Uh, most, most young people in Bali prefer to find job in the tourism sector. The professor I work with at the Subak Research Center in Udayana University often say to me that young students prefer to study tourism or international relation where I teach and did not want to be farmers anymore. There were times where the university almost closed the agriculture department because they could not get enough students. So the, for the past 10 years working with colleagues at the agriculture department of Udayana University, they have seen their enrollment go down while my department at international relation has seen a boom and it's ironic because I take my student right back to the farmers to do research. So since late 1990s, uh, the government of Bali, together with, uh, with the Ministry of Education and Culture, proposed to inscribe uh, the Subak system as UNESCO World Heritage Site. I first started getting involved when uh, Professor Stephen Lansing invited me to be part of the team that wrote the nomination dossier uh, in 2010 to designate the Subak as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And it finally inscribed by UNESCO in 2012, after, after 12 years of um, efforts. There are four sites dispersed in five different regions. This one is the Supreme Water Temple, Pura Ulundanu Batur and Lake Batur, where uh, farmers go and show their honors to the goddess of Danu. And then the Subak landscape of Pakaristan watershed over here that shows that the archaeological evidence that the Subak has, is, ex, has existed since the 11th century. Subak landscape of Chatur Anga Batukaru is like the most complex, the largest sites of all. And here's is where my uh, research sites located. And the last one is uh, the Royal Water Temple Pura Taman Ayun uh, to show the relationship uh, the farmers had with the royal kingdom in the old days. So the government created a management body called a governing assembly to manage the cultural landscape. Um, and I will talk briefly about how each of these management initiatives unfolded. The governing assembly consisted of various government agencies and local institutions uh, like the village, temples, and the Subak itself. The head of the governing assembly was the governor of Bali. Here's a photo of uh, one meeting uh, that the farmers has those with uh, traditional clothing with government agencies uh, with a green uniform um, to talk about the management of uh, the landscape. But as you can see from the chart, management was completely top down. Um, UNESCO encouraged the empowerment of local farmers in Subak as a cultural institution to serve as the owners and manager of the site. However, the structure of these governing a governing body was ineffective because of the overlapping authority of each institution. Uh, like I mentioned before, that these sites uh, disperse in five different districts with their own autonomy. Uh, the governing assembly also prioritized economic development of the World Heritage Site. Uh, so they're focusing on the increasing number of visitors to each site within the cultural landscape. In Subak Jatilui, uh, where my research is located, there was an increase of 400% of visitor in the first couple of years after designation as UNESCO World Heritage Site. So concern led the government to establish a coordination and communication forum to encourage dialogue between those who kind of like support protection of the culture and ecosystem of the culture landscape and those who wanting to do uh, or to build development uh, and utilization of cultural landscape of Bali province. The government also tried to engage the local community by having meetings with a uh, representative from the temples. Um, here are the priests from the temples. 
and the local kingdom. So they represent, uh, the priests represent the relationship between the farmers with the spiritual realms. They're called the king of the mountains. And the local kingdom represent uh, the human king to kind of like represent uh, the man and man relationship. Uh, here also they conducted, uh, the government conducted participatory mapping with the head of Subak to kind of like recognize uh, their, their territory, their Subak, and to have like a detailed map to show that the boundaries of each site and how they're connected to one another. And the government together with UNESCO representative also created a sustainable tourism strategy in the hope that it, it can create a visitor management guidelines. However, in 2015, a big development project happened in Subak Jati Louis. So you can see in the photos, a 40 acre area of productive rice field was converted into what they argued was a parking lot. There was an increase uh, in traffic congestion in the area because of the increasing number of visitors. Um, so the owner of the rice field here argued that they wanted to build a parking lot. They want to provide a parking lot, but it ended up as a huge restaurant, which provide a free parking lot. But still, it's a huge building right here. And because of this, uh, other farmers start following the, to develop other restaurant villas in the surrounding area and small funders within the Suba. Now, this management system have not been able to address the rapid changes taking place in the UNESCO World Heritage Site. There continues to be lack of mechanism to incorporate farmers' interests into management plans. What they wanted to protect in the first place is now accelerating the deterioration and loss of the Subak within the cultural landscape. Uh, the professor that I work with at uh, the Subak Research Center in Udayana University even mentioned uh, the latest research that Subak's probably not going to be in Bali anymore in 2013. 2030. So um, in 2019, uh, together with Photo Voice International, an international NGO based in Bali, uh, we conducted a Photo Voices uh, project. We wanted to hear from the farmers of their perspective on the issue they are facing as uh, the World Heritage Site. Um, it has challenges, of course, doing such an initiative. Uh, the community is divided in Jatilui among those that want to pursue tourism development uh, versus farmers that still want to protect their cultural institution and rice fields. So it was a very sensitive issue to come up to uh, decide with this uh, questions. We were very deliberate about wanting to identify different perspectives of local people and farmers, uh, including youth, uh, women, the elderly, those that pro tourism development, and those that pro conservation perspective. Um, we kind of work with a local facilitator from the community for about six months and to kind of like identify and invite uh, participants who would be willing to join uh, this photo voice project. So um, this is an interesting story because um, a student at my university uh, from a different department uh, contacted me after seeing his father came into campus. And he said like, my father is just a farmer. What, what was he doing in campus? And, um, and I told him that, oh, we were talking about issues of land use change in, in, in the Subak in Jatilui. And so he kind of like interested in that, not knowing that so many things happening back home he helped me identify a capable um, young, uh, young woman, I must say, uh, who live in Jati Louis and who could facilitate the Photo Voice initiative. Um, I want to also engage uh, more young people to be involved in the management of the landscape to get them uh, like at first aware that there are issues in their, in their suba. So working with uh, the facilitator, we identified multi-generational group of eight people that would get cameras for about six months. Uh, we first did a training on how to use the cameras, uh, facilitate discussion about key issues, uh, and plan to hold weekly meetings with them, uh, with the participants. Um, so at first, it took a while for the older participant to understand all the mechanics of the camera. They're also worried that something would happen to the camera, so it, they didn't take the cameras to the rice fields for the first couple of weeks. 
So it took us a while to convince them to, it's okay to take the camera to the fields and it's okay uh, to get a little mud on it because we want them to capture their daily activities. Uh, it was also kind of like difficult to get them to understand that this wasn't a homework assignment, that they don't have to take photos uh, to fulfill the researcher or the facilitator requests, uh, but it's just to kind of like capture what they're interested in. So they're, they, uh, we give them freedom to share their perspective about the SUBAC and, and, and the changes that's happening around them. And this is also interesting because the young participants, they're very good with camera. Um, they're kind of like focusing on taking photos, but they kind of lack the story why, uh, why they take those photos. They're just interested in the lighting, it's a good angle, this is a good photo. While the old people, uh, their photo at first was like blurred, uh, it's out of focus, but then they have a very rich story behind that. So we kind of then mix them in this, in this uh, project to work together. Uh, so the young people can help get the photo and uh, or teach the young uh, the older generations to take photos and the older generation kind of like share the story to the to the young people to the young participant <clears throat> so at the end of uh, each week we would spend an evening to discuss all of their photos Oops, excuse me <clears throat> each participant would get um, 10 minutes to share the stories behind their photos. Uh, and then we would connect them with the emerging teams that they agreed on. And we would discuss what type of photos they would go out to take uh, the following week. <clears throat> so before I go any further, I wanna stress that all the photos from here, uh, from here on were taken by the participant. And the first and the most common theme was development and land use change. In this photo, you can see how buildings begin to uh, take place in a productive rice field. They build near the river right here, which is very close. Um, a walkway on top of the rice paddies, which are prohibited according to local custom because paddies represent the goddess of Sri, the goddess of prosperity, and humans are not supposed to walk on top of the paddies. So everything about this building is not right. Um, Here's a restaurant that was being built and the farmers uh, complain about this development and they try to argue with, uh, with the developer, but they were unable to take up this claim to formal institution and debate with contractors uh, leading the, de uh, the development project. Here's another example of the irony of development uh, in Subak Jati Louis. There are development of tourists uh, like restaurants here and a, a large swing. So this is to attract Insta uh, Instagrammable kind of um, tourists or visitors who want to take photos uh, in the large swing. Uh, and this development, as you can see, cut, the, cut off the water supply. So the farmer below, they have to plant other crops. Sometimes it could be chilies, beans, um, but not rice because they need water. And this is also interesting for me because you can see here, there's a farmer resting in her in his small structure and still he's flying the Indonesian flag here. Like there was no support for him to survive, but still. So in this photo, one farmer took a series of photo of the prohibited uh, for development sign. This says uh, you can't build here because this is a, grand, a green belt zone. But the framing of the photo contrasts all the development that is taking place all around it. You have the sign here, and then you have all the developments happening right next to it. And it's mostly for tourism. Uh, the farmers joke that this sign is like a frog because it's just jumped to uh, different places. If there's a building happening here, they will move the sign uh, further away and you know to have a little green area behind it. So, uh, that's why they call it a, a, a jumping frog. One woman participant, um, she wanted to explain the, the land cover or uh, forest cover change that's happening on the top that kind of like uh, created landslide and also disrupt water supply to the subak. So she went up to the forest and, and she took a photo of uh, this kind of trees being cut uh, so 
she was able to show how drop and landslide dynamics were connected through these photos um, uh, as a result from the changes in the upstream areas that impacted uh, that impacting forests and water. The second theme that emerged was gender and labor in Suba. This is a photo of one of the participants, Ibu Aris. Uh, she joined the Suba community in Jatilui through marriage. So she has to learn how to do rice farming in Jatilui. And she said she continuously learning because everything is kind of like different from where she's from. Uh, different Subak has different way of doing their practices. So it's, you know, I understand why she said she needs to learn a lot of stuff. And she shared ex her experience migrating into the village from another Subak, how, um, one thing is uh, acceptable in her subak and it's an unacceptable in Jatului. So that's very interesting to know. Women are also involved uh, in the rituals and ceremony that are, that are associated with rice field. Uh, there are usually two planting season in a year, which required 17 rituals at each stage of the planting until harvesting. This is an example of a woman preparing um, a ceremony uh, on the, in one of the, Water Division Temple, they call it the, they call it the Ulun Sui or Pura Subak or the Subak Temple. And beyond working in rice fields, uh, these are the other responsibilities that shapes a woman's day-to-day -day lives. Um, this photo was taken by the oldest participant, uh, Dadong. Uh, she's a 70-year-old farmer whose rice field located at the end of the road right here. Uh, she took this photo by accident. She wanted to show the surrounding beauty her, of her rice field, but then she took a photo. She accidentally took this motorbike photo. Um, and it's kind of like interesting. We just say like, what's the motorbike doing there? And, and it kind of remind her that um, uh, her daughter and her granddaughter fell down the hill because of the narrow, uh, the narrow road here. And it's also, you can see here, it's like broken. She shared how she has been asking the head of the of her, her suba to fix the road, to widen it, and even to cover the irrigation channel here so that it can uh, pick up truck and run past through this area to go to her to her rice field. Uh, women, want, women want it to be safer and they want to find ways to help ease the burden of carrying harvest back and forth from their rice field. So, if there, there's a pickup truck that can go through this road, it will help their burden to, it will help ease their burden carrying this harvest. Like you can see in this photo, women have to carry the load of harvest on their head and they have to walk back and forth because there's no road access for motor transport. Uh, the photo of the cow uh, cow barn on the left shows the effort to collect cow dung to organize, uh, to for organic fertilizer right here. Uh, unfortunately, this has created more burden as was told by the woman participant because they have to feed the cows. This is creating uh, additional work for them to find feed from grasses. They say in the old days, cows were allowed to roam freely and find food by themselves. This is a good thing for the organic fertilizer, but we kind of miss the, the kind of like, the burden of the woman that have to endure. Uh, the woman also talk about all the side jobs that they do. Uh, here, one woman took a photo to show how they do all the hard labor work carrying the materials, while the men do the skill work of building the ditch on on the side. So, and this is a photo of a woman harvesting harvesting local rice, the red rice. Uh, Jatilu is famous with its red rice. Uh, with traditional cutter called ani ani. So you have to use it with your fingers to cut each stem because they're like traditionally harder. And it also represents Dewi Sri, as I mentioned before, the goddess of prosperity. So they have to cut the rice one by one with that traditional tool to show respect. Subak farming is often characterized by men working in the field. Uh, However, much of the labor of rice production in Bali is carried out by women. Uh, they also talk about how their roles are opt often set to uh, to the side because, and they do not then they do not get access to decision making processes. This is one of our participants here. Um, we asked her to not forget to take a photo of herself working in the rice field. 
because when we came and did the the first meeting with the farmers, we asked them to draw uh, what Subak is from their opinions. And they draw all these mountain forests, rice fields, villages, temples, but they didn't include themselves in that. So we want to kind of like remind them like they are also part, the, the most important, important part of the Subak. The third theme is the visitor management. So, um, since the inscription as World Heritage Sites in 2012, one participant mentioned that there has been an increase in the number of visitors to the Subak. Uh, the, this farmer over here, who's also the participant of the Photo Voice Initiative, said that visitors often talk to him whenever he goes to the river to bath his cows, and that tourists will not be interested to know about a uh, modern way of farming. So they would talk to those farmers who do a traditional way of farming. Um, and meanwhile, in Jatilui, most farmers now prefer to do hand tractors just to show the, the shift. So there's only one road in Subak Jatilui right here, and it has been congested with visitors, as you can see in the photos. They often come in cars, uh, one, uh, one car with one tourist, and there will be like 20 tourists with 20 car and created a traffic congestion on the road. And they would stop in this main lookout. Uh, here is the UNESCO sign. And they often just stop there to take a photo next to this UNESCO World Heritage sign. And this created conflict with local farmers because they used this road to commute between their home and the rice field. So during lunch time, for example, they're very hungry, they're very tired, they wanted to be home soon, but they have to stuck in traffic for like, sometime an hour. Um, so there is also an increased number of commercial activities like on the right here uh, where film shooting were taking place and they often didn't take permissions to the honor of the rice field to do activities. And it's very, um, it's very sad because rice field is a sacred place for the farmers. You're not even allowed to talk. Uh, when you walk into the rice fields, you just have to honor the, the nature, the sound of the nature. But with this kind of activities, it's kind of like disrupt all this traditional um, customs that, that the farmers have. And Subak roads, uh, other Subak roads uh, used by farmers to access the rice field and carry their harvest are being used for tourism activities like cycling. And most of these activities are carried out by tourism agencies from outside of Jatilui. They would bring their bicycle to Subak Jatilui in a car and ride along the Subak roads. The farmers talk about how they do not benefit from the increasing tourism activities that are taking place, but they have to receive the burden because of these activities. The photo on the right was taken when one participant followed a group of tourists and began to take their photos. The tourists were like confused and asked, what are you doing? And the farmers is like, I'm just taking your photos because he wanted to show the tourists how it feels to be him being photographed by, by, by them without ever asking permission. So he said the tourists would get offended by this. And he's kind of like wonder if the tourists ever think that they also offend the farmers. Um, this photo shows a contrast between two Subak roads. Here, uh, this road was being neglected because it is used for farming and the other is being maintained to support tourism activities. The farmers complained that the local government did not fix this broken roads uh, that are critical for them to deliver harvest. Uh, they also note how dangerous this condition can be. I still receive photos from the farmers uh, through my WhatsApp uh, that this road is now completely gone. Half of these roads, they're not there anymore. Uh, the participant requested to be involved in the visitor management because they know the story and places in Subak Jatilui. The photo on the left, shows a local farmer from Jatilui who are able to speak English and provide tour, ser tour services to tourists who visited Subak Jatilui. He would take them to walk through the forest trail to show water sources to the Subak and invited them to eat uh, local food in local homes. While on the right photos, it shows tour guide from outside of Jatilui who bring uh, tourists to, to, to the Subak only to take photos on the main lookout here or to have lunch uh, in restaurant and rarely tell the story of the Subak Jatilui. My colleagues and I hear about how these tour guides often make up stories that don't represent um, Subak Jatilui. 
Uh, the last theme is the generational inheritance of cultural practices. As a World Heritage Site, uh, I often question who will inherit the Subak and in what ways. The photo on the left here uh, was about working together to clean the irrigation channels. So as part of uh, the Subak responsibility, the owners of rice fields that share water through the same irrigation channels, uh, they have to help to ensure the flow of the water. So before planting season, they would just come and get together and start cleaning these water channels. In the old days, they did this work voluntarily because it is part of their responsibility. Uh, with the rise of tourism, they are able to get paid to do that activity because of benefits. Uh, because of the benefits they they got from the tourism fees, the ticketing to enter the Subak Jatiluli, but that's very small. It's like 3%, only 3% that they got. So uh, some of the old farmers explained that this is changing the character and the culture of, of the Subak. Uh, there's also an increased use of migrant labor, uh, which, may, uh, which many expect to be an increasing feature of the landscape in the future. Uh, it shows that the Subak landscape are changing into a tourism landscape for their aesthetic rather than for their productivity and cultural practices. So this raises question among families around difficult choice of maintaining the Subak for what they represent versus their role in, in tourism livelihood. Uh, the oldest participant took a series, of, uh, a series of photos of traditional tools right here to plow the land it calls Lampit. Uh, she also took a picture of how homes have changed over times. Uh, so she contrasted these two technologies, uh, the older technologies here, that are increasingly being hum hung up in the barn versus the introduction of new technologies such as hand tractors that increasingly use to plow the land. And during the discussion, uh, the farmers often say that this tool is better to plow the land, but it just takes a lot of energy and a lot of time to do that. So uh, the photo voices methodology is all about empowering local voices. We wanted to make sure that they were able to express their concern. Uh, we worked to connect farmers with extension workers, to advocate to, uh, for road construction, to discuss organic farming practices, to support community-based Subak tourism initiative. Uh, one interesting thing that emerged through our discussion was that the farmers really wanted an opportunity to present to UNESCO. Uh, we thought that they would want to present to village or district officials, but it turned out that they really want some sense of accountability from UNESCO. They expressed pride in their place in the Subak, as a World Heritage Site, uh, and they also wanted to share their perspective about how changes were taking place. Our Photo Voices initiative uh, helped farmers to talk about local perspective on the management of the landscape. Uh, at first, they were nervous about presenting their photos to outsiders, but it also helped to build confidence and ownership over their ideas. So this, uh, this was a practice presentation when students from Maryland University visited and wanted to learn about the Subak system and this give opportunities for them to finally tell the stories of their place. Uh, we held a virtual exhibition finally in 2020 uh, because of the pandemic with UNESCO representative and government agencies. Uh, this discussion are still ongoing. So, uh, Photo Voice Initiative was, uh, sorry, the World Heritage Site, the UNESCO destination, um, was intended to protect again land use change, development, uh, water diver uh, diversions, uh, top down state management institutions that have accelerated threats in the cultural landscape is quickly becoming a tourism landscape that represent a visual subak aesthetic. So, um, there needs to be a better ways to reflect local farmer concern and the photo voices show nuanced local perspective about inheriting the Subak and also had numerous creative ways for addressing these challenges. There could be ways to develop community based tourism maintain roads and many others. Um, any initiative for protective uh, protecting cultural in the institution and farming system should be rooted in their priorities concern and creative solutions. Uh, the Photo Voice Initiative provides a uh, space for much needed dialogue and tension between tourism development and conservation practices. Um, so discussing 
each other photos every week allow these families to express concern from different perspective and help to trigger new ideas for how to address them. Uh, these were the the convene. Um, these were then convened into a collective voice and raised with government agencies and were taken to UNESCO for consideration in management planning. But commitment to such process would require a change in the mindset among the state-led management institution that govern the UNESCO cultural landscape. And um, the representation of photo voice participant also raised new opportunities for empowering youth and women. People often think the SUBAC in terms of the men's organizations, uh, but this initiative really showed gender and generational perspective. It highlighted a lot of labor issues that are often hidden while also raising key, key questions about inheritance, uh, which cultural practice uh, are a priority for the older generation and which ones are a priority for those that will inherit them. And with that, I end my presentation. Thank you very much. I give it back to you, Terry. Thanks so much, we We, we have uh, uh, about 12 minutes now for some, some questions. Uh, let me just open it up to the people here and Stefan will uh, monitor the uh, questions coming in from the online participants. Any, uh, any first question? Let, let me start with one while people are are thinking of their own. Uh, I'm I'm guessing that the uh, case of the UNESCO World Heritage Site in Bali is is not entirely unique in terms of uh, some of the uh, impacts on local land use, culture, uh, unintended consequences. Uh, how are these? Uh, 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 example these cases from across the world uh, informing future World, he world Heritage Site uh, designation by UNESCO? Um, I'm going to say from my experience uh, involving in the like nomination dossier and also the management effort, uh, we always have a meeting and with the representative, right, with the head of the SUBAC. We never really have a discussion with uh, the local, uh, the local community, the, or the women, or the young generations. And very often, even if we invited them in meetings, they would just sit there and stay silent. Um, I think through this photo voice in, in initiative, uh, we give them empowerment through photos because once they hold uh, the photo which they take, which they took, uh, it gives them power to own the story behind the photos. Uh, the oldest participant here in the photos, she's 70 years old. At first, she's like, she's not talking at all. She always say, uh, you guys talk, you guys talk, you do the talking. And we kind of like encourage her saying like, okay, you took this photo. Can we know the story behind this photo? After a couple of weeks, she start telling stories. She start like remembering uh, what it was uh, being a farmer when she was young. And at one point, she came to us and said, like, wow, thank you very much for involving me in this uh, initiative. Uh, there are things that's being forgotten that so just, just suddenly came up in my head once I start taking photos. So um, I think this is a good way of, you know, of helping vulnerable communities to have, to have the confidence to tell their story because they are the owner of the landscape. They are the owner, especially for living heritage. They live there. They have to do a lot of things to manage their site. So I think it's just a good example that maybe in other World Heritage sites, they can just start giving a new ways, creative ways to start listening to these local perspectives. Okay, thank you. We're getting some questions and comments uh, coming in uh, from online. I'm, I'm going to call on one of those. Uh, Professor K.V. Raman, do you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question? Oh, hi, great presentation. You know, <clears throat> as you said, uh, local voices are really important at the grassroots level. But at the end slide, you said, okay, the guys who are going to be deciding this is going to be UNESCO, policymakers, et cetera, to bring change at the local level. So my question is, uh, you know, while photo voices is important, uh, stories are important at the local level because that brings change. But at the community level, at the national level, even at the biodiversity level, people 
especially policy makers go with both data as well as photos. So are there any attempts being made by you, your colleagues or anyone to complement photo voices with on the ground data through quantitative data? I mean, through surveys, looking at the impact on gender, the different uh, factors which are involved in biodiversity changes, uh, yields, et cetera, and how this data plus photo voices plus stories is then packaged and you know, made available to policymakers to bring that change. Okay, uh, this photo voices ended in 2020 and they had an exhibition with uh, government agencies. Uh, Photo Voice International, the NGOs, is now preparing the website for to show to showcase the photos and the story from these participants. So there's an open dialogue with the uh, government agencies. Even through the exhibitions, they uh, they kind of like welcome the participants or local community to go directly to them to ask for uh, like solution to their problem, like the to fix the broken road, for example, instead of going through all the bureaucracy uh, coming into their office. Uh, there are researchers that doing research, uh, like quantitative research that you mentioned, um, but those research usually, I mean, when I talk to the farmers, they often say, oh yeah, they come here and start asking questions to get data, but nothing really happened afterwards. And and they feel like they're just being used as a respondent. They give, they give the answers and that's it. Uh, with photo voices, they feel like they're being involved, they're being, you know, part of the research project and, and the photo belongs to them. So they feel like they're kind of like fully involved in the process. Um, but I'm hoping that in the future with all these combined data, we can uh, create something that's beneficial for the farmers. Uh, I work with Stockholm Environment Institute, for example, um, to collect how traditional knowledge uh, in farming uh, with the uh, technologies on climate change. So we work with uh, climatologists to see how uh, climate change impacted uh, the, the practice of the farmers. And we have a dialogue between them and the farmers really think that, you know, it kind of helped them to, to understand why the, the rain pattern, for example, changes that they have to adjust their planting seasons. Um, and for the, for the scientists, they kind of understand or they kind of know the kind of traditional knowledge that the farmers use to, to kind of see or adjust with their agricultural practices. Uh, in one example, for example, uh, this farmers here took a photo of a spider, uh, a local spider then, and he mentioned that when the spider's head is down and the lake goes up, that's when, if I'm not mistaken, that's when the planting season, it's not, I mean, it's, it's not the time to do the planting. But once the head is goes up and then the feet goes down, that's how you do planting. So we kind of combine this kind of knowledge with the scientific data that the scientists are having. I hope that answers the questions. It's still an ongoing process. So, yeah. I understand it takes time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is John Beckmans. I'm, uh one of Humphrey Fellows at Cornell. And uh, I thank you very much for the presentation. I was really, really impressed. And uh, seeing the story of Subak, we can see, we can think that some people were behind the change. And you too, because you made the, the story that we are enjoying here. But who were really more involved, like mentors for the community, and what can you advise young leaders and the students here present who want to bring changes in their communities back home? Because uh, we, we, we think this is uh, something that can take to our home and help people. What can you advise? What strategies can they um, use to help uh, the community back home? Okay. Um, I would highlight the word change. Um, when I, when I joined the nomination dossier of the Subak, I visited Subak Yatilui in the 1990s and it was all green. And now if I go back every year, there are changes that's happening. Um, at first I say it to myself, like I want it to be like it was to be, like, you know, but then when I start talking with the farmers, 
they want to have change as well, like the use of traditional tools, for example. It, it's, uh, it's more effective, but it takes more uh, energy and time consuming. So if you want to help, you want to go back to the community and you want to make, uh, if you want to support them, I think you should ask the question of change because they're the one who lives there. Uh, you should ask them the, the amount of change that they want to have. They probably don't want to stay the same, like the Subak. I cannot make them stay the same like a thousand years ago. There has to be changes, and but that changes should be decided for from them because they live there day to day. So I would suggest for young people, if you go back to your community, uh, you have to have a dialogue with the community and ask them about the changes they wanna have, the changes they wanna take or the changes that they wanna accept. Um, I hope that answered the question. Did I miss uh, your other questions? No, I think that, that was good. We had uh, uh, another, uh comment and question online uh, from uh, uh, a farmer in the state of Vermont here in the U.S. And uh, first, congratulating you on, a, on your uh, presentation. Mike is there. Go ahead, Mike. You can, uh, you can ask the question. Hi. Hi, Hi everybody. Hi. <laughs> um, thanks. So first of all, this is really fantastic and, and interesting. Um, I'm curious, you mentioned that young farmers are considered 40 and 50 years old. And that's sort of a, an issue in other places too. Um, did you do you find that there's potential for using something like photo voices to help um, get younger people excited about farming? And and do you have any suggestions for how to do that? Yeah, there's uh, in Jatiluwi. There's only one young farmer that I know, which is like in the their early thirties that kind of like decide, oh, I'm going to stop my job in the city and I'm just going to go back home and do farming. And for me, that's like, wow, I think you're an exception <laughs> because everybody, every young kid in, in Bali, they want to go to the tourism sector. They want to be a surfer. Uh, they don't want to be farmers anymore. Uh, my team uh, at the Subak Research Center, we often argue that maybe we should change the name of farmers. Instead of calling them farmers, maybe we should just call them a landscape engineer, you know, because it might kind of change the mindset of the people. Like farming can also be uh, beneficial. Old farmers, um, we have this photo voice initiative by inviting old farmers and young people. And the young people usually work uh, uh, cutting woods or as dancers, they don't really go to farms anymore. And when they tell, when they heard stories from the older farmers of all the values that they have, it kind of like remind them like, oh, it's not just rice field and water. There's a lot of things that's happening there, all the rituals. Like you, you cannot say anything when you go to the rice field. Young people mostly go there not just to take photos, but the old farmers would say, you can't even say anything. It's, it's your connection with the nature. You have to hear the sound. Uh, you have to have like the scarecrow. They make it with, with, the, with the rice patties, you know, with the organic... Um, materials instead of plastic and everything. And it's kind of like create dialogues between them. I, I would say it's pretty successful. I just hope that we can have a larger participants to have that kind of dialogue. Um, yeah, I think uh, it's an ongoing process, um, you know, but maybe at first we need to change the mindset that farming is not just about a uh, hard work and small productivity, but it's also about the values of you doing or you going back to farm to the farm and there are and there are other benefits if we could just get a lot more percentage from uh, the tourism the visitors that came there there are a lot of money that's kind of like going to the rice fields like if the university i mentioned student doesn't want to study agriculture anymore the university then provide like full scholarship and then there's an increase of students who say like oh i want to study agriculture now uh, so as long as the government willing to provide those uh, support, I think I think there are possibilities we still can attract uh, young people to to go back farming, especially in the pandemic. Uh, Bali is to completely shut down from tourism. Uh, I heard a lot of people are going back to to farming again. Okay, thank you. We, we we're we're out of time now. Uh, we're going to capture some of the other comments and questions on the. Uh, the chat and, and we'll share those with you in case you lose them. Uh, some really interesting ones about the, uh, the photo voice uh, 
methodology in response to uh, the conversation with Professor Raman. So thanks very much. If everybody would share with me our appreciation. Thanks so much.